Hey guys, Joel here, back to the Word today with a three minute book review and then some minor reflections on this work right here, The Nicene Creed and Introduction, just put out by Philip Carey, published by Lexham Press. I just finished reading this, wanted to share it with all of you in about three minutes and then go through some personal highlights and reflections on some of the content. As always, remember to like, subscribe for content like this. I've also put in a written review of this on my blog and you can get that uh, in the description of this video and also a link to Carrie's kind of bio through Eastern University which is also there in the bio or in the description as well. So with that let's go ahead and get started. So first up I have my notes right in front of me. Who is this for? Straight from the book. This is a book for Christians who want to understand their own faith better. Um, and thus grow in the knowledge of God by learning what the ancient teachers of the Nicene faith had to give us from page three and four of this book. It really is for any Christians who want to study the faith in a different way. There's lots of people right now, even in evangelicalism and in the Christian world, who are reviving studying the creeds. And I personally, and the confessions of the faith, and I think personally that's a good thing, not because we elevate um, their authority over the Bible, but they are trying to take from Scripture, summarize it in a way that we can speak rightly about God. There's a lot of people out there who say they're Christians, who are not speaking right things about God or believing right things from the Bible because they don't know the Bible. And so the creeds and the confessions give us something of a baseline, a summary point that helps us lead us back into biblical truth and to say that truth correctly. So this is for any Christian who wants to study that more in depth, fully recommend. Second, who wrote it is written by Philip Carey. He's a professor of philosophy at Eastern University in Philadelphia and author of several books, including Good News for Anxious Christians and The Meaning of Protestant Theology. You can check more out on the publisher's website as well as his bio for on Eastern University. Great reading there, great dude, really encourage it. Really loved his writing in this book. Third, what stands out? Wow. So many things stand out in this book. Um, first thing I want to say is the clarity, brevity, and usefulness of this book. He, it is at the baseline an exposition walking through line by line of the Nicene Creed. Uh, Matthew Barrett says at the beginning in one of his uh, recommendations that he is. A, this is a um, oasis in a desert. It's this idea that it is a big deal. This is an amazing book, and what Carey has been able to do in brevity and clarity is unmatched. And I really love and would totally tell you that he did it. He did a great job of keeping things clear, brief, but also keeping it useful. Second, beautiful printing of this book stands out. You see here the way this book is printed. It's laid out really nice on the inside. You take this dust cover off. You have this front cover, the foil, even the inside of the book great details in this work. Moving on, I like the way that it presents the right amount of content. It's teaching, but it's teaching that leads you to study more. He does a great job of that. It's also, in, he talks about the interesting, trivial, and tragic differences mentioned in the creed. There's three lines that he talks through those areas in the introduction. It's pretty cool as he works through the Greek and the Latin version of the creed. Time right there, three minutes has passed. The final thing I will say is that there were various sections that I enjoyed. And I think everyone will have sections of this creed as he goes through line by line that they will enjoy or learn more from. Personally, I learned a lot from the section on the Lord and his covenant name of Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, and how it is applied to Jesus Christ. I love that section. I also love the begotten sections that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, and he also was begotten, not made, and some of the implications for that. Lots of good content there. And I enjoyed talking about the Trinity, how the Trinity works, and some of those relationships, specifically with the Son and the Holy Spirit and the Father as the divine source and those who proceed from him. Really good stuff in this book right here. Fully recommend it. It's a little bit over a 200 page read. Uh, totally worth it for those who will dig in and want to learn more about it. So there's really the review section right there. I could stop the video right here, but for those who want a little bit more in depth, I'm going to put up some notes here and walk through the highlights. So there's major sections of this book. He talks about the background 
on the front part of the book in the introduction, and then he moves from the historical setting just into the line-by-line -line sections through what we believe slash I believe the very beginning, the confession and what it means to confess a creed. And then he moves through Article 1 to God the Father, Article 2, Part 1, the Eternal Son, um, Article 2, Part 2, God Incarnate, Article 3, the Holy Spirit, and then the epilogue on the Trinity in simple terms using some of Augustine's statements, of seven statements that he originally gets from um, Augustine uh, to explain the uh, Trinity in simple terms. So just walking through that, I'm going to go ahead and put the notes up that should be right now on the screen and share those uh, with you. I'm not going to hit every note, but here's some of the big things that stood out for me. You can find more of this on my blog, and I totally would encourage you towards getting this book if some of these sections pique your interest because he has way more to say. These are just my highlighted quotes and notes. So first up, the Nicene Creed originated because Christians were appalled. He shares this at the beginning. They were appalled called it the heresy of Arianism, which said there was a time when the Son was not, that Jesus was created, Jesus was made, he was not eternally begotten, the fathers were appalled by this. So returning to the quote, it says, but this book is not about a heresy, but about the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ taught by the creed that grew out of the faith of Nicaea. It's a book for Christians, and he goes through his audience who want to understand, learn, and know more about the faith that we have, the common faith. He moves into the creed presented in this book is the most widely used confession of faith in the Christian world. I think that's a pretty cool statement there. He says we are talking lowercase o in orthodox, not Eastern Orthodox or Jewish Orthodox. We're talking about general Christian belief. He says we're also talking lowercase c as in Catholic and universal, not Roman Catholic, but what's applied to the general, the um, evangelical or the Christian church as a whole, the universal church. And then he also talks about lowercase e. I just shared it a little bit right there. Not evangelical as far as a political party or a voting block or some other things we're used to hearing, but as those who are dominated, defined by the gospel. So good things on page eight and nine from that section. He says there are many versions with slight variations of the creed, um, but he has kept his version to mostly the Greek, and then he's highlighted some of the differences as they appear throughout the book and telling you what those are. Uh, the three aims of his book, uh, shared on page 11 and 12, because words are old and have layers, uh, the, this aim, book aims to give you access to those layers. He does a great job of that. It's used to, number two, to open doors for further study. There's different places I found myself putting in the margins. Word study here, this would be a great spot for it. Different things, I could go study this. He's opening doors for you to see biblical terms clearly. And then if those you want to go deeper in those terms, he's giving you good places that you can go. But also, I would say he's giving you enough to whet your appetite, and then you can go do more further study on your own. He also says the third aim of this book is to show biblical Christians how the creed gives words to what they already believe, so that they can hear these words as gospel, the story of our God. It bears mentioning here, as I already said earlier in this video, creeds are not above scripture. The goal of a creed, a confession, was in the time of the early church and others when people didn't have access to God's word or they were trying to stay solid and sound in their teaching was to put together a summary of the faith so that people knew what they were confessing and what they believed that was taught throughout the whole of scripture. So its authority is nowhere close to the Bible. I think it can be valuable in personal worship. It can be valuable in corporate worship to help the, us summarize the Christian faith and know what the Bible teaches. But ultimately, the Bible is the sole authority, the spoken word of God. And the creeds are just helpful tools to both memorize and summarize what the Bible is saying. With that being said, he moves into and that my interpretation of the value of creeds right there. We move into Article 1, God the Father, heaven and earth, talking about that all that which is above and all that which is below, the whole of creation from top to bottom, the visible and the invisible, talking about those that are visible and those that are spiritual, things that we cannot see. And so he talks about that. This section also covers God through Christ creating everything from nothing, ex nihilo. This is a cool thing that you're going to see throughout the creed. He brings it up multiple points about God creating and God but um, God not being born and how particular the early church fathers were about that distinction specifically when it comes to the son 
uh, also how um, evil was not created, but is um, by God, but it's just the exact opposite, absent of what God created, of what is good. Then he moves into Article 2, Part 1, the eternal Son of God. Talks about one Lord, the fact that Jesus is applied to this title of Lord throughout uh, the New Testament. The Creed picks up on that, that he is God. And it says the Creed follows a widespread pattern in the New Testament in which the words God and Father go together. And the ways to say that Jesus is God is to call him Lord, applying to him the sacred name of the Lord the God of Israel. Moving into this great section, I already mentioned it earlier and what stood out to me on Lord and Yahweh, those names, where they come from, how to use them and respectfully use the name. So, so Jesus is Lord means that Jesus is the Lord, the sacred name of God of Israel rightly belongs to him. That is the heart of the Christian faith and is therefore the heart of the creed. See 1 Corinthians 8, 5 for more study on that. Then he moves into the only begotten son of God. This stood out to me. This is something that's hard to describe with words. And he even talks about that. But it speaks of origination of the eternal son of God from his father. It's very important paragraph on page 60. I have there right in front of you about the begotten son having no before to our time in, uh, after in time, but an eternal beginning and origin from the Father. It's really hard for us to describe that. He says, for this reason, it's uncompre- incomprehensible for us. And so we have to uh, affirm those truths of him being eternally begotten of the Father and eternity past and no fixed time at all by a negation or a negative statement. So for instance, we know we can't say there was a time when he was not, for he has eternally always been. So those are just some things. He says two further notes on terminology. The Latin translation at this point uses a word born. It's probably not the best use of the word, but he goes through how it's not exactly heresy in the book. He also talks about many scholars use this term of eternal generation in this area and explains a bit more about that term. Then he goes into the trivial difference, God from God. He just basically says it duplicates something that's later. It was added by some, not a huge deal right there. Begotten, not made, bringing up the same types of things, um, or in older translations, begotten, not created. He says making and begetting are two fundamentally different ways to bring something into being. Begetting is more like something coming to be by nature, whereas making is more like art. And he goes into some of those differences and why begotten as a word and concept and what it means is very important. He says the creed is saying two important things with this phrase that he was begotten, not made, that the son was not created or made, but was begotten. And the eternal son of God does not belong in the category of creature. He says, so who created God? Like a child may ask. He says, the answer is that no one creates God. Not even God can create God. However, God can beget God. And he did on page 75. And then I tell you right there, look at Carrie's section for arguments and clarifications on what he means by that, how we speak about that. And once again, we affirm that truth usually through negative statements of saying this is not true. What the church or what the Bible says, even though we can't find these precise sometimes words for what the Bible is saying. And you can see my notes right there. He then goes into this aside, this excursus is what he calls it on the word analogies. This is the Greek concept of the word of the logos, good section, good content there. Moving into article two, part two, God incarnate. God was incarnate. God chose this. He chose to be incarnate, to be fleshified, or fleshified, as he says there on page 109, 110. A good section. It talks about how it's not the same as embodiment. It's also not the same as reincarnation. And later translations talk about became incarnate, but that adds something that the creed avoids, this idea of uh, God changing. And so he talks about how the early church fathers knew God didn't change, and so they were very careful in their wording in this section. He also talks about um, God incarnate from the Holy Spirit. Every work of God is the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This idea of born of the Virgin Mary, but by the Holy Spirit. And he gets into the Trinitarian working in that um, and how the Trinity works in that way. He talks about he became a human. The Son of God was not only fleshified, but inhumanized and without sin. He gets into the Gregory of Nanzianzen. Um, comments about that which is not taken up, that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, had to take on flesh so that he could save those who were in flesh, humans, um, and what is not taken up and assumed is not 
healed on page 124. And then they talk about this picture of him sitting at the father right hand with four pictures. We get this from Psalm 110, where this adopted son of David is going to sit on the throne. We see that the true son is Jesus now looking back at the Old Testament and other pictures. And so he goes through the whole creation, worships Jesus Christ. Um, confessing he is Lord, Philippians 2, 6 through 11. The lamb at the center of the throne in Revelation. You see the reference there on the screen. After making purification of sin, Jesus sits down at the right hand of God. We see that present in Hebrews, multiple places, not only sitting down, but also being priest. And then on the day of Pentecost, it is Jesus at the right hand of God who pours out the Holy Spirit, Acts 2. Then we move into the Holy Spirit section, the Lord. Uh, this is a really good section, kind of similar thing, 2 Corinthians 3.17. The Holy Spirit is God. It's applied to him in different places and worth studying out the Trinity and how the Spirit of God works. One God, uh, three persons is present in that section. He moves to how he proceeds from the Father. And this is uh, one of the things. This is the beginning of the Son is one divine procession, and the procession of the Spirit is another. Page 181, John 15, 26. And from the Son, this is the tragic difference that he mentions at the beginning that someone added at a certain point of the Creed. I think it believes it says in your notes right there that I gave you. It was added by the West side of the church, the Roman Catholic Church, but not the East. It wasn't universally adapted. Carey says he doesn't really believe, you see on the notes there, that it's technically heretical, but it probably shouldn't be added because the idea is that the Father is the divine source. And so he says when it's phrased and it's added, there's room for the Father to, through the Son, um, proceed the Spirit to proceed from them with the Father as the divine source. But the early church fathers would have known that it, the Spirit does not proceed or come forth from the Son as a divine source, but it ultimately proceeds from the Father. And so that's important. So it's not necessarily heretical because you can define it as proceeding through the Son, um, the Holy Spirit coming through the Son, you know, from the Father. But that clarification is needed and important. Then moving into these uh, four adjectives and distinctive marks of the church on page 196 through 197, he talks about that we are one, then one body dedicated by one, uh, one head, Jesus Christ, uh, Romans 12. The church is holy. It's set apart for Christ alone, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5. The church is Catholic, which means... Um, from the Greek is universal. We are speaking Catholic here of a small c, which is a result of the church's unity, 1 Corinthians 11. And the church is apostolic, meaning that we preach the gospel that was preached by the apostles. Not that we have their power, their authority, but that we do it, we preach the same gospel. It says, because the gospel by which we are saved, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2, is the faith that God gave the world through the preaching of the apostles. So that's how it's apostolic. Uh, it talks about we confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Just to note here, Carrie stays away from baptism views, but he speaks more or less about it. He shares a little bit about both, about it being baptized, but he doesn't get into a specific doctrine position. I am personally Southern Baptist, Baptistic in my um, views, um, in different, there's other background there as well, but he doesn't really get pigeonholed into that whole thing, just talks about what baptism serves as the entry point. And so I see there on the notes, I wrote it for you. He focuses on this section, not on one particular baptism view, that he writes well, it, depending on your view, you'll be okay with it. He sticks more towards what the early fathers said and the, in that section, but he focuses more in this section on the fact that those who believe are baptized and this marks their entrance into the common faith we share. So he's more or less focusing on the fact that when we confess this faith, when we believe this faith, we are baptized in obedience and it starts the race as us uh, following the gospel and this common faith. Then you have the epilogue, which I've already briefly talked about. He goes through some bare bones scaffolding for sharing the Trinity with others without using too much loaded down theological terms. He does that with the seven statements of Augustine, that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And we're talking there fully God, um, being worthy of worship, different roles of distinction, but they're, you, know, you see there, they're fully God. Um, then you talk about the statements, the next three out of trio of negations, that they're not confused. They're not 
um, the same person just putting on a different mask or so. It says the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, and then you add monotheism to be in line with what the Bible says. There is only one God. Then this final quote from him. Um, the words one and God are essential in this framework. He makes a note in his section. He says it is just logical bare bones. So these statements, logical bare bones. To put flesh on these bones, you need to put, do things like teach the creed and preach the gospel and tell the story of God as scripture tells it. So with that, I know this video was a bit longer. I really love this book. It's beautifully printed. It was sent to me by Lexham Press for ex in exchange for an honest review. But I'm going to tell you, this is something I am glad to have on the shelf. I will come back to again and again, I believe, in the future. It was super helpful, super clear. And I know I'm going to be pulling it out for different classes to share what it means but to be only begotten, what the name of the Lord means, his personal covenant name, and even maybe to explain the Trinity and some of these other unique things that are difficult sometimes to explain as Christian. So with that, I fully recommend this to you. Check it out wherever books are sold. Pick it up. Until next time, continue to read, treasure, follow the word. If you have questions, recommendations, would like to know more, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. Keep it constructive, helpful as we learn together. God bless, and I'll see you guys soon.